Hello, everyone. This is Greg Trevinson, Editor-in-Chief at Writer Magazine and your host for the Writer Magazine Insider Podcast. Our guest today is C. Jane Taylor. Jane describes herself as a writer, a biker, a mom, a wife, a warrior, and sometimes a bit of a chicken. But age 50, when she received an invitation to join the AARP, she ripped up the letter and bought a motorcycle. On April 19th, Jane is releasing a new book called Spirit Traffic, A Mother's Journey of Self-Discovery and Letting Go about a 10,000 mile cross country motorcycle trip she took with her husband and son. An excerpt from Jane's book will be published in the April 2021 issue of Writer. You can find out more about Jane and her book Spirit Traffic at her website, cjanetaylor.com. Welcome to the show. Thank you, I'm so happy to be here. Well, folks can't see us. Uh, we're on Zoom, uh, but you are in Costa Rica right now. Is that correct? I am. My husband is a yoga teacher, and he's leading two yoga retreats here in Costa Rica. So I had to carry the luggage. Ah, <laughs> so, sounds like a real chore. Uh, so yeah. I, when you, we first started the when we first started the call, I heard heard some birds in the background and so forth. Uh, I've never been to Costa Rica, but it sounds like a lovely place. Well, here's, here's a, a funny little insight. I did a meditation in the morning yesterday and um, it was a sound meditation and I heard howler monkeys in the jungle near me. And then I heard motorcycles <laughs> and I thought, I'm in the right place. <laughs> nice. Do you think you'll get a chance to do some riding while you're there or is it uh, not that kind of a trip? I might. I've been looking at this little scooter, the Honda Navi. Have you seen yeah, this? Absolutely. It's sure. cute as hell. And people are just zipping all around on these little scooters. There are other bikes down here for sure. I mean, it's transportation rather than just great sport. But um, the Honda has, has caught my attention. Well, uh, to give folks a little bit of a background on who you are, uh, you've got some biographical information on your website, and uh, you've lived a pretty interesting life. It says that you've uh, <laughs> dropped out of high school at 16, graduated from college at 20, became a single mom at 30, and learned to ride a motorcycle at age 50. Uh, you've been a cook, a sculptor's assistant, an SEO expert, a yoga teacher, and a writer. And part of the reason we're talking now is you've got a new book coming out called Spirit Traffic, A Mother's Journey of Self-Discovery and Letting Go. So I wanna know, uh, you know, it uh, sounds like you started riding later in life. Uh, what inspired you to do so? My son, when he was in college, when he was in high school, whenever we drove to get together in the car and a motorcycle went by, he'd say, CBR, you guys, CBR, you guys. <laughs> so it became like a mantra. And we got to recognize different kinds of bikes. And then when he graduated from college, my husband said, why don't we get bikes and ride across the country? So yeah, <laughs> why don't we? So we started, we saved up and bought three used BMW 650s. We wanted something that would get there and back. You know, we went 10,000 miles and the, the, um, the BMWs were awesome, super great. Still my favorite bike. I've got other bikes since then, but I love my uh, favorite. So you're, um, you have a name for your, you have a F650 GS. What is the, you have a name for your bike? Oh, Mr. Hopkins. Mr. Hopkins, what, what inspired that name? Okay, Mr. Hopkins was my teacher, the music teacher in junior high school. And he needed, I played the cello as a girl and also in college, but he needed someone to play the bass in the jazz band. So he gave me this giant string bass and he gave me the Mel Bay, learn how to play bass handbook and just put me into a practice room. Mr. Hopkins thought I could do it. So I named my motorcycle, Mr. Hopkins because I had a lot of doubts about learning to ride. The bikes, 650 BMWs are pretty tall. Sure. And, uh, I have a dirt driveway at home in Vermont that's very steep. So it was a scary beginning. So I really needed Mr. Hopkins at my back to help me out, <laughs> build confidence. So your, um, your husband's name is John and your son's name is Emmett. Is that correct? 
Yes. So, so Emmett, it uh, sounds like he was uh, into motorcycling before you and John got into it. Was John a motorcyclist as well, or did you both learn to ride around the same time? Well, there's a little bit of a backstory. We all learned to ride at the same time. But when I was a little girl, my mother had a motorcycle shop when I was like six, seven, four, five, six, seven years old in a Honda of Ann Arbor was the name of the shop. And so I grew up around motorcycles and I had my sister and I, she's two years older. We had a little tiny Honda 50 that we rode around a circle in the backyard. You know, we just wore out the grass in the backyard. And when we moved away from Ann Arbor, I didn't ride for 40 years. So I was pretty much starting from scratch, but I've always, I've always um, loved bikes. I've always, you know, I see them in the road and think, oh, someday maybe I'll ride again. But I didn't really take it seriously until my son is like CBR, CBR, you guys. So, you know, and they, John had a scooter. He had a Yamaha Zuma scooter that he rode for two years in bad weather. We live in Vermont. So he rode like 10 months out of the year, which was a little sketchy. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and so we all, and I had a scooter, this the same uh, Zuma, which was a lovely thing for a year before I got the real bike. So, uh, well, I mean, the scooter is a good place to start. I mean, you know, people that have uh, uh, ridden bicycles and for me, like I didn't learn to ride a motorcycle until I was 25, but I had been a pretty avid mountain biker. Uh, I lived in Florida in high school. I did a lot of jet skiing and that was the stand up jet skis that actually require some balance. And so oh, cool. all of that stuff comes into play. And since you even had uh, some exposure to a motorcycle as, as, as a young child, even though it's, um, you know, Riding a motorcycle, those are perishable skills. I mean, like I said, I imagine it sounded felt like starting over from scratch. But um, you know, unless what's an interesting thing, just as a little aside, is um, I had interviewed on the podcast um, um, Ryan uh, McFarland, who is the founder of Strider Bicycles. Or it, so Strider bikes are those little balance bikes for kids. And yeah. um, as part of his business, he learned that. Um, and it's pretty shocking for someone like me and perhaps for yourself is that kids these days, it's not that uncommon for a, the majority of children to have never ridden a bicycle is that it's just the physical activity. It's different. And so he's, that's why he started a, a nonprofit uh, called all kids bike. And they're trying to get uh, bicycle training programs with balanced bikes and then conversions pedals into the PE classes of elementary schools, because he's like, yeah. well, if you don't learn to ride a bicycle, then you'll never learn to ride a motorcycle. I mean, it's just sort of right. like, because you have to deal with, I mean, it's a single track, two wheeled vehicle. You have to deal with balance, all the coordination and so forth. So uh, yeah, it's so learning that stuff is, um, it, it's important to learn as a kid, so. Oh yeah, I I bicycled, well, my sister and I bicycled as kids. That was That was our life, you know, you had to come home before the street lights came on kind of thing, you know, sure. so. Well, so you were saying that you, uh, John and Emmett learned to ride at the same time. So did you all sign up for like an MSF course or some sort of training program and you all went through that? Was that back home in Vermont? Yes, John, I don't think John took a safety course, but Emmett and I took a safety course together, which was great fun. The One of the teachers had been his algebra teacher in high school. And so <laughs> he, he picked on us and um, we had, we did this in maybe in August in Vermont and it was really hot and we had to wear all our gear and we learned on these little 250s, which were super cute. We had a great time and Emmett passed the course with the highest marks they'd ever given. I was so yeah. proud. I didn't cry. I didn't want to embarrass him. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I worked really hard at, you know, and um, it was, I recommend the safety courses. It was wonderful to learn how to ride in a great safe environment with someone who's not your spouse, your girlfriend or your boyfriend right. and um, somebody who wants the best for you. You know, it was really fun. Well, and the nice thing about those courses, MSF courses, I know there's some other state courses is that they don't assume any prior knowledge. So, you know, and as you know, I know you've been a yoga teacher is that, you know, um, 
people don't, people that learn how to do things, you often forget how you learned how to do it. So you don't necessarily know how to teach it to someone. Teaching something is not the same thing as knowing how to do it. So you're right. Having a friend teach you to ride a motorcycle, they don't, they get frustrated because they jump steps ahead. They think that you already know how to operate the clutch and then you can coordinate the clutch with the front brake and the rear brake lever and all of that stuff. There's a lot of things to deal with. And MSF course steps goes through that step by step so that, you know, people are not assume any prior knowledge. And it sounds like it worked for you and Emmett to build your confidence up to become a rider. So. Yeah, it was great. I still, during the trip across the country, I wrote to my motorcycle instructor, I'm trying to, Peter Booth was his name. I write, I wrote to him, I learned all these things from you and look what I'm doing now. Thank you so much kind of thing. So it's, it's a great, uh, great lesson to take that course really enjoyed it so how long after you took that course did you john and emmett embark on your cross-country adventure well we took there was a a winter we took the course towards the end of the summer in vermont when it was super hot and then winter happened and we left on the cross-country trip may 12th and the it was the first time i'd ever ridden in the rain Ooh. Yeah, so we had BMW has these the Motorrad rain suit, which is like hazmat green. You look like the Michelin guy, you know, (laughs) it's like not flattering. But so we put on our suits and it rained for the first two weeks of our trip. So um, the first two hours were pretty hellish because I didn't know what to expect in the rain. And uh, but I got used to it, you know. Well, riding in the rain, I mean, because we've all ridden and driven in the rain in a car, but, you know, where you're in clo- in a closed vehicle, you can stay warm and dry. Um, even riding bicycles, like you said, uh, except for maybe mountain biking out in the mountains or something, rarely do you ride a bicycle in the rain. So to ride at highway speeds on a vehicle where you're exposed to the elements, yeah, that yeah. uh, get- takes some getting used to. You flatter me with the highway speeds. It took me <laughs> quite, <laughs> it took me quite a while to get up the nerve to ride the speed limit. And um, th- there was a joke in my family about it. But eventually I did learn to ride the speed limit. You had learned to ride, uh, got your uh, certification in late summer. You went through a winter. You don't get much riding done in Vermont in the winter, I'm sure. Uh, so that you started again in the spring. I'm sure you had to refamiliarize yourself with a lot of the, the you know, techniques of riding and then you embark on this cross-country trip with John and Emmett. It was wonderful. We were out there for seven weeks. We camped most of the time. Um, Well, I remember one night in particular in June in Colorado, there was snow. So we went to a hotel, which was (laughs) great. (laughs) Um, But yeah, it was just terrific. I want to do it again and i'm gonna do it again here's the fun part that i'm looking forward to um i'm gonna do a book tour on the bike so starting in may i'm gonna ride through new england and then june july august across the country doing readings in libraries bookstores in people's houses so i'm looking for posts along the way i'm hoping to stay with people and have like a sort of house party. I'll do a reading and friends will get together and tell their own stories of adventure. I'm really looking forward to making this book tour sort of an inspiration for other people. Awesome. Yeah. That's yeah. Great. So tell us a little bit about your trip. I mean, you said it took six weeks, actually mean seven weeks. Uh, you began and ended in, in Vermont. So what sort of route did you take to get through the country? We went from... Uh, Colorado Springs was our first big destination because uh, one of John's brothers lives there. So we went through Illinois. Illinois was amazing. You don't think of Illinois as being amazing, but the the Midwest, the you could smell the countryside, all the changes. It was really, really beautiful and the people were marvelous. And so we went from Colorado Springs up through the snow yikes i close my eyes when i say that (laughs) and and then we went south to get into some warmth and we ended up in las vegas which was 
marvelous and stunning. And it's the first time I'd been there. So it was a complete culture shock for me and also for my son. I remember um, we got, we stayed at a fancy hotel in Las Vegas. We went to the Flamingo and we parked the bikes in the garage under the hotel. And we were so happy to be out of the sun. And we start taking off our stuff and we grab our gear and we go to the lobby to check in to our room and we look around something smells terrible it was us <laughs> <laughs> so we 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 cleaned up and we swam in the pool and then walked up and down the strip and i remember at one corner were two women wearing tassels and thongs and high heels and making eyes at emmett who was a handsome young man so he was completely embarrassed and thrilled <laughs> And then another corner of the strip in Las Vegas were a bunch of monks with pug dogs, maybe 10 monks with their little dogs on leashes. And it was just a wonderful contrast. We, and then from Las Vegas, we went to Death Valley, which was spectacularly beautiful, really marvelous. We, we camped at, um, Death Valley National Park or Death Valley National Campground or something like that. We rode into the valley at sundown and then wow. left at dawn. It was very, very hot. Um, and then we went up high into the mountains in California, which was marvelous. And on the way back, we went through Montana and Wyoming. The way back was faster because Emmett had plans and had things to do. and. By that time, I could ride the speed limit. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but just a wonderful time. I really recommend it. Well, you know, the interesting thing about riding that it's a rare opportunity for people to ride for seven weeks, uh, you know, and, and, you know, Americans aren't great about taking vacation. Uh, you know, maybe we get two weeks a year. Rarely do you take it all at once. So yeah. uh, to be able to have that extended uh, amount of time, I know that you are a new rider, but I'm sure like riding day after day after day uh, is it's like an immersion experience with learning a foreign language or something. It's like the only the best way to learn it is to just do it over and over again. If you only did yeah. short rides on the weekends, you would learn a little bit more, but you always have to kind of relearn it. But every single day you're throwing a leg over the saddle uh, and you're riding all day, every day. So uh, I'm sure your your skill set went from from whatever level it was when you began and just skyrocketed over the course of your trip so yeah i it did i remember at the beginning trying to go the speed limit we even had a hard time riding for more than an hour without stopping we'd be exhausted thirsty you know all different things but then on the way on the way home at one point i looked down at my speedometer and i was going 70 miles an hour <laughs> <Yeah>! <laughs> i was so excited but the um I got really comfortable on the bike and familiar. And I think that my skills doing it every day for seven weeks was pretty great. Yeah. Well, Good because immersion. I mean, you're all, you never know what you're going to get into. So it's road conditions. Like you said, you started a couple of weeks in the rain that is brings its own challenges. Um, not just with handling the motorcycle, but just staying comfortable and alert and dealing with fatigue and things like that uh visibility through yeah. your, your face shield all of that stuff but then you know if you if you cross the rockies and you got into the mountains of of california you're dealing with um you know much more technical riding in some of those roads i'm sure sure yeah the pacific coast highway got some of those twisties are pretty sharp yeah and there are a lot of people on that highway who want you to go faster <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah absolutely yeah well, I mean, you mentioned Death Valley National Park. I mean, I live in California, uh, and that's truly one of my favorite places. I just rode through there. Uh, my wife and I stayed there for about a week. We weren't motorcycling, but between Christmas and New Year's, we spent a lot wow. of time um, hiking because I've ridden through that place. It's the largest national park in the country. It's It's got stunning vistas. Uh, you've got snow-capped mountains and the lowest point in the northern hemisphere all in the same place. Um, yeah, but uh, we were had a chance to hike some of the, the canyons because you drive th you, you ride through those on the roads, but then there are these canyons that go up through all these multicolored rock and it's uh, it's it's really it's really lovely. 
but um, yeah. it's just one of those things where, like you said, if you can experience one of those places, such as the roads through Death Valley at sunrise or sunset. Um, the last time I went through there, there was a big dust storm going through. So it gave it a really eerie wow. sort of thing, as well as just sort of yeah. headwinds and crosswinds and so forth. So, uh, yeah. So is there, um, you know, you mentioned Death Valley, you mentioned Las Vegas, uh, some of uh, the Pacific Coast Highway. Are there some other favorite spots that you got to see or, you know, experiences that you had that you really enjoyed? My very favorite spot was Kings Canyon National ah. Park. Beautiful. And don't tell anyone about it because there weren't very many people there. <laughs> I also really loved, um, oh, now I can't think of it. I'm uh, here I am in Costa Rica trying to come up with these other places. <laughs> um, yeah, oh well. It's gone. I lost well, I do, it. I do know that road down into Kings Canyon. It's actually a pretty, you know, I wouldn't say treacherous, but it's, it's a, beautiful. you know, there's, there's, it's a pretty steep and narrow road down into the to Kings Canyon. Uh, and uh, it's kind of one way in and one way out. And it's, it's absolutely beautiful, but uh, you're right. Yeah. Not a lot. Well, of the road into Kings Canyon on one side are, are cliffs that go up high on the other side are, is the, canyon king's canyon is the deepest canyon in the united states so you look down and the the road is a pretty narrow two-lane road with a small stone barrier on the canyon side that woof <laughs> i tried to stay towards the mountains it was definitely it was definitely exciting and in that area we went on Burr Trail, which is wonderful, really beautiful. And the, the roads around Utah, we stayed at a place in Bluff, Utah called Recapture Lodge. And it's a wonderful place where bikers stay. There's a swimming pool. There are these cute little cabins that look like throwbacks to the 50s. There's cold beer at the convenience store across the road kind of thing. And um, a lot of great riders convene there at recapture lodge nice. we met a guy his name is johnny winona ross he's an artist but he's a bm he rides for bmw and he's a he's done like the baja race and stuff like that and he gave us some really great advice you know you don't want unsolicited advice from people but he's so mild-mannered and thoughtful that we struck up a friendship and he was really helpful in his great suggestion was stand up, which <laughs> took took me a long time to to do. But when I finally did it, I was like, "All right, Johnny Winona Ross, thank you." So you're talking about the so the Burr Trail is not paved. Is that what he's talking about? Stand up riding on yes. some of the unpaved stuff. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So you got yeah. some unpaved. Yeah. That's something that a lot of people go years and years without ever leaving the pavement. So if you got some off road experience in this trip, oh yeah. You got the full full complement of riding. I I did some of it. Some of it I grumbled and got off my bike and Emmett rode my bike through the rock gardens because I was like, yeah, no, I'm not, I'm I'm not ready to do that. But toward the end, well, maybe the second half of the trip, I was able to ride across the rock gardens. We we didn't ride across water, rivers. I mean, there was water on the highway, but um, yeah, we did. A consider well maybe 15 percent of the roads were dirt wow which it's a great practice for me because in vermont most of the beautiful roads are dirt roads and so using both aspects of the dual sport is really a sweet benefit of that particular bike well i absolutely for me i mean some of the uh, best places to ride I'm not a really highly skilled off-road rider, but I, it's sort of like when you go on a hike, you can go to places that you can't get to from the road. And just like going on some of these national forest roads or some of these, I think Burr Trail is one of these kind of like backcountry um, byways is that uh, in the, particularly in the West, I know it sounds like in Vermont as well, but there are many, many roads that are dirt or gravel or whatever. And to get some of the best vistas or to get to certain campsites or something, um, you have to be able to go off road to, uh, to at least to some extent to, to access those places. Yeah, it's, it's, um, 
we we did some riding in the Gaspe Peninsula and also in the Magdalene Islands, Les Îles de la Madeleine. And some of those dirt roads turn into sand. I have a funny story about that, but I'm not so great on sand. So <laughs> where, where is this peninsula? Where's your, where's that you're talking about? Well, the Gaspe Peninsula is the northernmost part of Quebec. And in Vermont, we're right on the border with oh, Quebec. Okay. So, And the Gaspe Peninsula goes out into the St. Lawrence Seaway. And there's a beautiful road that goes along the edge of the Gaspe Peninsula that is very wonderful for motorcycling. A lot of riders do it. And um, the Les Îles de la Madeleine, the Magdalene Islands, is in the middle of the St. Lawrence. And you have to take a ferry from Prince Edward Island to the Les Îles, the Magdalene Islands. And that was, that was pretty exciting, getting on the ferry. We um, we got on the cargo ferry, so we had to ride our bikes onto the ferry. And the, this ferry wasn't taking passengers. It was just taking trucks and two mm -hmm. little motorcycles. And we ride onto the ferry. The, guy, the ferryman looks at me and he says, how long have you been riding? And I say, oh, well, we came along this way. We've been out for, I don't know, maybe 1,500 miles. And he says, no, no, how many years have you been riding? And this is all in sort of broken English, French. And I say, oh, about four years. And he says, I think you'll be OK. <laughs> and I'm thinking, oh, man, what is this about? So we get on the bikes and ride them onto the ferry. And the ramp was the ramp to get onto the ferry was designed for these giant uh, semi trucks, big sure. giant ramp. The ramp, they had a little wooden like two by six that the for the motorcycles to ride across and all of these handlers who are you know lining up the trucks and stuff are pointing at this little tiny wooden ramp for me to ride over and between the ramp and the ferry was the ocean <laughs> <laughs> so, so i had to do it i didn't have time to chicken out i might have chickened out had i thought about it but I didn't have the opportunity. So up the ramp I go and everybody's clapping me on the back for doing such a great job getting on the ferry. But, you know, so there's, there are all kinds of adventures like that, that you don't anticipate that, that back to the motorcycle safety course right. will prepare you in some ways for that kind of adventure. Well, I mean, that's the thing about, especially if you're a trip like you took with uh, with John Emmett, I mean, since there were some off-road components, there's unpredictable weather all over the place, is that, you know, if you had to sit around your living room talking to someone and say, oh, could I do that? You'd probably say no, but once you're in that situation, whether it's having to ride up this sketchy ramp to get onto a ferry, or you're like, well, we don't have any choice but to ride through this rainstorm, then you yeah. really figure out what you're made of. Yeah, yeah, it's... It was a great, the big trip was such a great confidence building adventure. Before the, I didn't imagine that I would write a book when we decided to go on this trip. We were just celebrating Emmett's graduation from college and doing something outrageously fun as a family. But at the end of it, I just, when I got home and back to my desk, I just started writing and I wrote for six months and, um, there was a book, you know, <laughs> I wrote and wrote for six months and then I put it down because it got hard to do. And then I ended up working with a writing coach who helped me get through the rest of it. But the confidence, I mean, I'm able to have a podcast with you. I'm able to talk to you years ago. I would have been a chicken. I would have been so nervous about it. But I think that doing a big trip like that builds your confidence and um, it's really helped. Motorcycling has sort of changed my life. I have, I'm a freelance writer. My work is better now. I've written a book. There are all these sort of, um, you know, I'm this, I feel like a powerful woman now. Whereas before the big trip, I was sort of a chicken shit. And now <laughs> I'm just like, you know, I can do it if I can ride through Death Valley or if I can get on ride up the ramp to the ferry or whatever. I feel like, oh, yeah, I can do this interview. I can, you know, I can write an article for 
Sunday Times magazine. I don't know if anybody's listening from the Times, <laughs> but. <laughs> well, I mean, it's also, I mean, you're, you're also talking about going on a, a book tour via motorcycle. I mean, you know, with, you know, fat, go back five or 10 years, or like if you told your future self or your future self told yourself back then that, hey, you're going to write a book and you're going to ride a motorcycle around the country to promote it. I mean, you've probably been like, no, you're crazy, but here we are. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty excited about the tour because it's taking a long trip because I'm self-employed and my husband teaches yoga at University of Vermont. We have time to flexible time in the summer and just spending all that time on the bike is so terrific. It's my dog doesn't love it. He has to stay home with a babysitter, but um, I'm so excited about the tour. It's really well, really I mean, I don't know if this is part of your plan or something that you would consider, but uh, since you all rode BMWs, if you've got some photographs from your trip, I know you've provided some photos with the, uh, you know, we have an excerpt from your book. Uh, it's going to be in the April issue of, of Rider. Um, but BMW dealerships, I know, often host some of these traveling, um, you know, people that are traveling around the world via motorcycle or that have done some trips. And um, you may very well find some BMW dealerships that would be more than happy to have you come talk to uh, you know some of their um, their customers and help you you know get a little bit more exposure yeah. to that group, not just bookstores or something. So yeah. Yes, yes, I look forward to speaking to people at dealerships, and I hope to speak to women who might not have the nerve and just like give them a little sharp elbow. You can do it, kind of thing. It's it's going to be fun. I really look forward to that. Thanks for that. Uh, suggestion. Sure. So, uh, so again, tell us a little bit more about, so your book is coming out. It's going to be released on, I think, April 19th. Uh, again, the, yes. the title is uh, Spirit Traffic, A Mother's Journey of Self-Discovery and Letting Go. So this is going to be a book that you can purchase online, bookstores. Uh, tell us a little bit more about how, when it's coming out and how people can get a copy of it. Sure. It's the publication date is the 19th of April. I'm so excited. It's almost time. Congratulations. And um, you can, thank you. You can order it on my website or you can order it anywhere books are sold. I mean, you'll be able to buy it online through all the, all the major channels, but I, I like to encourage people to buy it from an independent bookstore or me. That'll be fun. Um, just to support small business. Sure. So I also, oh, I recorded an audiobook version. Really? Which, yes, it was great fun. I went into a very wonderful studio and I read the book and in some of the, some of the book is sad and some of it we fight and we're mad as hell at each other. And I'm reading this thing into a microphone and I got all of her job. And, they, <laughs> and the sound engineer would say, a little less emotion, maybe scale it back a little, you know, because... But anyway, you'll get a, if you listen to the book, you'll get a, a real taste of what it was like, but, um, well, because you, yeah, so you experience it, you're not a trained, you know, um, you know, voiceover person. I mean, you sort of went through it yourself. So how could you not have some of that emotion in it? So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Makes it, it makes it more authentic. I'm sure. So the well, end was particular particularly difficult where Emmett rides away into the sunset. And it took me like 10 takes to read through the thing about, <laughs> oh, my little boy is gone kind of, but yeah. So I have an audio book. The printed book is available through all the channels as well as my website. Thank so you. So your, your asking, website right? is C as in the initial C, janetaylor.com. And uh, yes. we'll make sure. cjanetaylor.com. Yeah, there's, you know, and I encourage folks to go check out that website. We'll have a link in the show notes is, uh, like I said, you've got some interesting biographical information about yourself. Um, there's more information about how you can find out about the audio book. Uh, you'll, you'll have information about uh, your book tour will be on the website as well. So if folks live near one of these bookstores uh, or what other, other locations, hopefully they can come meet you in person and listen to some of your book uh, in live. Or I'll do reading in their living room or depending on the pandemic in the backyard, invite your friends over. We'll have a glass of wine. We'll tell stories together. That's another aspect of the book tour that I'm looking forward to. Awesome. 
Well, like I said, we're going to have an excerpt. Uh, the It's a chapter from your book, I believe. It's called Isaac and Eli. And uh, those are two people that you meet on your trip. And to me, like, I love that chapter. One of the things that is so great about um, a motorcycle journey is not, you know, just the roads that you're on and things like that, but it's the people that you meet, the situations you're in. Um, you, you're there with your, your, your husband and your son. So you've got family dynamics. I'm sure it's a uh, uh, you know, there's, there's challenges that go with a trip like that. And that's, and that's what people want to read about. They want to read about, they yeah. want to live vicariously through other people is some people may be able to go on a similar trip, but you know, you read about people hiking Mount Everest or hiking the Pacific Crest Trail or doing riding around the world is yeah, we want to go on the journey with you. So I appreciate you sharing that yeah. with the readers. So, oh, thank you so much. There's, there's a, um, uh, an audio sample of the book on my website too. I'm trying to think of what chapter it is. It might be Isaac and Eli, but anyway, it's thank you for reading my excerpt and pu putting in, in putting it in the magazine. I'm just thrilled. Well, like I say, it'll give people a chance to you know get a taste of the book and hopefully encourage them to to buy a copy. Uh, you know, it's always great to have a, a new. Uh, motorcycle book to 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 read and and add to the add to the collection. So, well, Jane, right I appreciate your time. I'm glad that we've mostly had a pretty good internet connection. We had a couple of little interruptions, but uh, I I and I didn't hear too many birds. Uh, but uh, hopefully, you enjoy the rest <laughs> of your day there in Costa Rica. How much longer are you going to be there? We have one more retreat that starts on. I should probably know this, but I think it starts on Sunday. So we'll be here about a week and a half more. I'm actually looking forward to going home, seeing my dog, working on my book tour, longing, looking longingly at my bike. <laughs> you know, it's, I travel a lot for work. I've had the good fortune to do some uh, tours and travels in other parts of the world and around the country. And as much as I love travel and going to different places, it also makes coming home that much better you know it's like you appreciate what you've got yeah. it's always nice to get a little break from the home routine and go out and do something but to come home you you appreciate what you've got and uh that's actually a great part of the travel is, is the coming home so i agree i agree well again thanks for your time and uh for the writer magazine insider podcast i'm greg drevenstead thanks for listening and keep the rubber side down if you've enjoyed listening to the writer magazine insider podcast please subscribe, leave us a positive rating, and tell your friends. We also encourage you to visit ridermagazine.com, where you can get the latest in motorcycle news and reviews and sign up for our free weekly newsletter. You can also subscribe to print and digital editions of Rider Magazine, which is published 12 times a year. Thanks again for listening. 